welcome back. Um, last time we talked about uh, this battle that's going on and how we need to discern the spirits and basically understand what is the battle, what's going on here. Because we talked about the wind and how the wind or spirit generates what we see physically through the agency of man. Now, to understand this and be able to see a little bit better, I think we need to talk about a couple of things today. First of all, I've got up here relational life versus propositional life. These are two distinct things, but they're related. And, and this is where some people will, might get upset because people tend to be either over here completely or over here completely. And there's a proper balance. Okay, so let's talk about life first. Life is always something joined to something else. So when you're born, the spirit joins the flesh and you become a living being. And that happens in the womb. But that spirit entering you, that entering that physical form like in the creation of Adam, that joining together of spirit and flesh produces life. When you die, what do they check for if they think you're dead? They want to know, do you have any breath? Are you breathing? Because without breath, you don't, you don't, you don't go forward. Uh, you die. And when you die, even the physical components of your, of your breath the physical components of your body actually start separating. So this is life. Okay, so what would relational life be? Relational life would be where I'm more concerned about how I relate to others. Like, you know, what do they think of me? What do I think of them? You know, um, am I close to them? Am I distant from them? Am I... Uh, being, it, are, are the decisions I'm making, are they being made in relationship to other people? Like, like I talked earlier about the time when the brothers um, were attracted to these girls, and they asked me, well, weren't you attracted to them? I said, yes, but why did you not then, you know, uh, go with these sisters when you had an opportunity? I said, because... I'm relationally connected to my wife. And had I done that, had I formed a relationship with some other woman that would have grieved my wife. And see, this is part this is when it says grieve the Holy Spirit, what does it actually mean? It means you have taken and you're in relationship to someone else other than the Holy Spirit. And that grieves the Holy Spirit. That's what it's talking about. So, what's propositional life? Well, propositional life, by, by far, people tend to go there because it tells them what they think are truths about the world they live in, that they can order their world and they can make their world uh, predictable, safe, they believe in that. But the problem with propositional is you got to know the truth. And remember last time, or time before we talked about little t truths and big t truth Jesus. Well, you can know relationally the big t truth Jesus, and you can know little t truths about him. But which, which, and and you you may may start out here and you may end up over here, and that's the whole concept of what the spirit when he said to the disciples. I'm sending you the Spirit, and that will make us one. We'll be relationally connected. Okay. So that's what we're talking about. Now we're going to use, uh, flesh this out a little bit with some things that uh, we a lot of times don't understand. Okay, now first of all, I put up here Father, Son. Now, this is going to probably upset some of you. Okay, but... 
God is much greater than our ability to understand him. And the only way we can understand him in some ways is by propositions or categories, okay? Like we know what's hot versus what's cold by, well, this is hot, this is cold. That's how we come to understand things. So when when it talks about the father and the son, it's not excluding women or motherhood or anything like that. It's giving you categories so you can understand certain unseeable, unknowable spiritual principles so you can get a glimpse of them. You may not understand them fully, but you get a glimpse because you, you're given categories. Propositions. Okay, so father, son, There's there, we're going to talk about that. Now, who's the father in the Godhead? Let's talk a little bit about the Godhead. Okay. Um, as Christians, we believe that there's, in Scripture, it's clear, they, Scripture talks about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when, and it's very clear that when it's talking about the Father, it's talking about God. When it's talking about the Son, it's talking about God. And when it's talking about the Holy Spirit, it's talking about God. Okay, so there are three, you know, we get the concept of the Trinity, and we won't get into that because that's terribly misunderstood. But the concept here is that in the Godhead, there's these three personas that interrelate to each other. It's a relational life. They're one, three but one. They are relating to each other, not propositionally, okay, so much as what do we know? Jesus said, I came to do whose will? His will? No, I came to do the Father's will. So his understanding of the Father was the Father sent him, and he had a relationship through the Holy Spirit as a man, through the Holy Spirit, with the Father. And they moved together across the earth, the three of them together as one, in the very body of Jesus Christ. It's a pretty amazing thing. So here's, here's so, so who's the Father? Let's get back to that. Well, if you look at the concept of the Father, what, what is a Father? Well, a Father is the person by which the seed comes into the woman to create or expand, create life, create children, and those children go on to create children, and the children go on. Now, I'm not dismissing Eve's role, but we're not talking about that. We're trying to understand the father's son. So the idea is the father is the creator, or he's the originator. And he originates something, and that's going to be what we're going to look at after he originates something. Okay. Well, he originated Lucifer. Through the word, the word spoken, we've talked about that, how when, when the word was with God and in God, but it was breathed out, the word was breathed out, everything that came, exists came into existence. Before that, there was, God was self-contained. There was no any, anything outside of himself. Look at it that way. It's... He was, and then he breathes out, and all of a sudden there's things outside of him that he can be in relation to. Because as the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, it was their purpose to create something apart from them so that they could be in relationship with it. Now let's get back to the Father and Son. So God creates Lucifer, he creates the first atom, and, and these actually can be together, but let's, let's just look at them separately for, for, for a moment. Okay, let's look at the physical, how we get to Jesus. Okay. And, I, and I know Jacob, and Jacob ends up becoming Israel and all the 12 tribes, and eventually 
we get to Jesus. Uh, uh, we, we don't need to go through that, but I want to show you something very important. He creates Lucifer, and he creates the first Adam. Okay. Pretty important. So he creates Lucifer, he creates the first Adam. We know from Scripture that the angelic race is called the sons of God. We also know that man is called the sons of God. Because when Jesus becomes a man, he's both the son of man and the son of God. So he, he in fact, his favorite term for himself is, I'm the son of man. And he came to create a family where men would be adopted as sons into the family of God. So here we have two Two, I'm going to call these two sons. Now, let's look at this. Who was created first? Lucifer? Who was created second or came into being second? The first Adam. Okay. So we have the first son and we have the second son. Now, in their culture, who inherited what the father created? The first son. Okay. Now, uh, I remember growing up as a kid lot longer ago than maybe some of you are. But there were, fathers would create businesses that they would pass on to their children. In fact, a lot of times they were called like Smith and Sons or something like that because the idea was I'm creating something and I know I'm going to not be here forever so I'm going to pass it on to my son or my daughter. Okay, my children, let's look at it that way. So I'm creating, God's creating a kingdom that he's going to pass on. Okay, that's what's going on here. This is the big deal. He's creating a kingdom. He's creating something he's going to pass on. To who? Well, let's see. He has Lucifer over here, first son. He has Adam, second, second son, second that came into creation. So, and in their culture, the first son always got everything. Second son didn't get anything. In fact, that passes on through the royalty, the kings. You know, it it all becomes pretty corrupted because what happens is, regardless of merit or anything, it goes to the first, first, first. So, God calls Abraham. And he says, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. In fact, uh, your descendants are going to be so many that they'll be greater than the stars. Well, Abraham doesn't have any kids at all. In fact, his wife and him have been trying, but they haven't produced any children. We don't necessarily need to get into that. But what happens? Well, Abraham, who's the seed, has two sons. One by Hagar, the, the maidservant. I believe that's what her name was. Might be wrong on that. And he has one through Sarah, his wife. And the first one born is who? Not Isaac, Ishmael. Now, Adam, the seed, in the way this is set up, is creating the, creating the, creating the kingdom. The, the, the family that will have so many children and it's more numerous than the stars, okay? That's what's going on here. And so he has his first son, Ishmael, and his second son, Isaac. He has Isaac. Does he pass on his kingdom to the first son? No. It's a very important principle to understand what's going on here in, in Scripture. Okay, so he passes it not on to Ishmael, but he passes it on to the second son. Pretty amazing that he does that. That's pretty amazing because what that is telling you, he, God's not following someone's expectations. Just like it was the expectation of Ishmael that the kingdom would be passed on to him, there's somebody who has an expectation that 
what God's creator is going to be passed on to them. Now, who would that be? The first son, the angelic race, uh, which we're going to identify as Lucifer, uh, Satan, okay? Has an expectation. And when God creates the physical world, who does he give authority over it? Think of it as a minor kingdom, okay? He gives it over to man. Was Ishmael upset? Yeah. When Isaac got everything, in fact, Isaac uh, gets scared, you know, when he meets up with Ishmael, you know, this guy's going to seek retribution for what happened. Okay, so clearly there's, there's some enmity here between these two. There's definitely enmity between Lucifer and the first Adam. Now, I, I will let you know at some point these there's certain sects, cults you might call them, that say Lucifer and Jesus were uh, sons of God in the sense that they were both angels, okay, and that um, God chose Jesus over Lucifer. Well, that's not correct. He chose Adam, or mankind, over the angelic race to be in, have relational life with. The angels have propositional understanding of God. But the scripture tells us very clearly that they peer in and they try to understand salvation. They don't know what's going on, and it's kind of a mystery to them. Now, why is it a mystery? Well, if you're in the propositional world and everything's black and white in some ways, you know, first son, not the second son, you know, uh, who does the best job, all of this kind of stuff. You know, who doesn't sin, who's sinners, and all of that. If you're in the propositional world, it makes sense that the, the best or the first would be inherit the kingdom. That makes sense. But if you're in a relational understanding, who, from the way God looks at it, because remember, he's relational, the Godhead. That explains the dynamics of who God is. He's love. Love always needs an object, something to, to focus on outside of itself. So he, he's relational in that sense. Is he going to be in relationship with propositionals? No, he was in relation, or, or statements, little t truths. Or is he going to be in relationship with some creature, some creation that he can pour his love out that will reciprocate that to some level? Never to the level God can pour out, but will reciprocate. So let me ask you this. I'll use this as kind of an example. Suppose you have, there's two women, and one of them is really, really beautiful, and the other one's not bad looking, but she's, you know, not as beautiful as this one. Your desire may be for this one, if you're a man. Look at it if you're a woman. You know, there, this guy may be the football star, and this guy over here, you know, he's a bookworm or whatever, okay? And they're, they're both okay, but your desire may be for this one not necessarily this one. So initially, you might look at it from the creation's perspective. Is he above the, fir the first Adam? Oh, yeah, heavens, yes. In fact, he's above all creation. He was the most beautiful, the most wi wise being God created. But did he want to be in relationship with God? No. He wanted to rise above God. So go back to these two women. Your desire may be for this one. But what if she just looks at you and says, I don't want to have anything to do with you. Or this guy looks at you and says, you're, you know, no way. But this one wants a relationship with you. Who are you going to choose? See, that's what's going on here. So no relationship, didn't want it. And the angels are looking and saying, 
we don't understand this salvation thing because we don't understand relational life. See, that's they're peering in there trying to figure this out. They understand all of this. And see, a lot of Christians are over here too. Their, their life is propositional. It's not necessarily relational. And so they're, they're uh, trying, to, trying to get, trying to understand that. They're peering in, trying to understand what's going on. Okay, let's go down here. So Isaac has two sons, Esau and Jacob. Who comes out of the womb first? Well, Esau, first son, firstborn. Jacob comes out second. Now, this is really crazy because, see, Isaac even wants to pass it on to Esau because of the first son principle. But Jacob tricks him, and he gives the blessing to Jacob. <laughs> Amazing. The implications of all of this is just astonishing if you stop and you try to think of it relationally versus just propositional. See, we can, we can memorize these genealogies and we can memorize all this, but there's something much bigger behind what's being said that we're supposed to see. And one of the things is this first, second son principle because now... You, I think you can begin to understand why Lucifer hates his brother, what, what could be termed as his brother, Adam, man, because they're created lower, less than the angels. They're not the smartest kid in the room. In fact, they're a little bit of rascals. They'll, you know do terrible things. They're sinners. They don't measure up to the glory of God. They don't measure up. Yet, what does the scripture say? God says, he loved the second son. He poured out. He hated. He, he hated the first son. And he poured out. His, he hated Esau. I hated and it doesn't mean hated in the sense of, but we could get into that. And Jacob I loved. Ishmael, did he, did he, did God bless Ishmael? Yeah, Ishmael becomes a great nation. But he poured out who would inherit his kingdom through Isaac, okay? Because he chose the second son. This is, this is the principle. So here, this Son over here is madder than hell because he's not going to inherit this kingdom. He's just not. So what does he do physically on the earth? He tries to keep the first Adam from coming to the second Adam, Jesus, to become the bride to inherit the kingdom. He's going to do everything he can and I put demons over here because this, this is something we've got to understand. This is what happened before the flood. Now, it's happening after the flood, and we can get into that. We will eventually get into some incidents and look at some current events and try to discern the spirits behind them and what's going on. Uh, but before the flood, what happened? We know in Genesis that the sons of God, which are these angelic beings, came to earth and corrupted the seed of man. And they tried to create for themselves sons and daughters that could inherit the kingdom. And those sons and daughters of the first son over here oppressed the second son to the point that it was so corrupt that God said, 
we got to do a reset here. We got to do this over. Okay, so that's why the flood came. The, in uh, the Old Testament, when he says, go in and kill all the whatevers, even their children, it's because of this, this battle here, this infiltration of the genetic code. Okay, now, this is very important to understand that this is going on today. It's, they're trying to, um, the forces over here are trying to influence our genetic code, everything about us. Okay, and I, I'm, I won't get into all the things that is happening there, but that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to wipe out this bloodline. In fact, uh, I, I will share this. Um, they'd have no problem if the whole world was run by AI. Now, it's not going to happen, but because that gets rid of human beings. That gets rid of human beings, and, there's, and they can inherit the kingdom. This is, what's, this is what's going on because there's a new kingdom coming, a new heaven, a new earth, where these two realms merge together in a new kingdom, new earth. Not heaven as we know it. It's new. It's completely recreated. And that's the kingdom we're talking about here. Okay. So back to demons. Where do the demons come from? Well, I'm going to give you a theory, which I tend to support, is that the demons are the dispossessed of a body spirit of the, the Nephilim or the emergence of the daughters of men with these angelic beings. They created sons, giants they're called, uh, you know, in scripture sometimes. When, when they go into the promised land, there's these giants and we look like grasshoppers among them. You, you've probably read that. Well, these are Nephilimic beings that have become, uh, exist. They were wiped out at the first flood, but uh, basically portals were open for these angels to come in and mess around with the genetic code again is, is basically what I believe happened. And we could get into that, but, but the principle here to understand is this guy over here is really upset. <laughs> And that's a great understatement. He's really upset. And he's going to do everything he can to destroy the line of Adam. Now, I always put Jesus in red. Why do I put Jesus in red? Because it represents blood. See, by his blood are we forgiven. By his blood are we healed. You know, it, he actually when we're adopted through his blood, our nature is changed. This is the new nature versus the old nature. The first Adam's nature became corrupted, but the second Adam restores the nature of God back in the people. Now, we don't experience it perfectly here because we're way focused over here rather than being in Jesus. You know, in fact, a lot of people, how they live their lives is they're not even in touch with the Holy Spirit, but they're saying, well, I, I won't do this because it's against the law. I won't do this because, oh, I've screwed up. I broke the law here. And they live their life based upon what they believe is right or wrong because from the tree of knowledge, that's what we got. That's the way we look at the world. We don't look at it relationally. We can... We get glimpses of it because we have families and we form relationships with people, but we don't necessarily live relationally every moment. We default to the flesh, which is to say, oh, God's mad at me. I better follow this. My husband's mad at me. My wife's mad at me. I better find out what the right thing to do. And See, God doesn't even look at things that way. That's the way we look at him. So he addresses the way we look at him through Jesus and Jesus' sacrifice and uh, gives us assurance that he's not really upset or mad or angry at us. He's angry at these guys over here. And he's very angry at anybody who goes over there, okay, and forsakes 
like the angels did, their first estate. See, all men, were. this was their estate. All angels, this is her estate. They forsook their first estate to become physical so they could create sons. That wasn't their estate. They, they, and many people over here forsake their estate, which is to inherit the kingdom of God and come over here. And they actually fight against this estate. And as we go forward, that's some of the things we're going to be looking at is what's going on here. We'll probably talk about the money supply. We'll talk about a lot of things and how it's, it's, uh, it's flushing out. But for right now, let's keep this in mind. Relational life versus propositional life. Am I just united with propositions, little t truths, laws? Is that, is that my life? Or is my life a relationship with Jesus? Okay. Then understand that the war is because of this first and second son. That's the war. That's what's going on. And that's what we're experiencing here. And in future episodes, we're going to look or discern what's going on through the Spirit. We'll do that. But until then, I just ask, uh, pray a blessing over all of you, and I ask that God continue to open up your eyes, open up yourself to a relationship with Jesus. And I, I guarantee you, as that starts to happen, all these propositions will take on a completely new life because you'll have where the understanding of where God is, where they propositions in the relational come together and the man, Jesus Christ. Till then, bye.